There have been many different investment options available to investors over the 100 plus year history of capital markets. If you're curious about how different asset classes have performed, what lessons might be gleaned from the last century, or how we might use history to predict the future, stick around. Over roughly the last 100 years, we've been able to observe the capital markets in action. We note several patterns over this time horizon. First, riskier investments are associated with higher returns. Second, risk-free investments earn just a small amount above the average inflation rate. The idea is that while you earn enough on average to protect your purchasing power by investing in the risk-free asset, you don't earn much of a premium above inflation at all. However, the bigger question is, how much risk do I have to accept to get the returns I need or want? Or how low of a return do I have to accept to achieve the safety I want from my investment portfolio? Fortunately, we have a measure that we can use to consider both risk and return in the same number. That measure is called the Sharpe Ratio, and simply put, it is calculated by subtracting the risk-free rate from the return associated with a particular asset in a particular period, and then dividing that outcome by the standard deviation of the returns. This then gives us the return per unit of risk so we can compare across assets. Historically, we have thought of the stock market as a broad index of large companies represented by indices like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones 30 industrials. Large cap stocks are the benchmark by which most investments are measured, both because the S&P 500 index is reported everywhere, it seems, and also because the S&P 500 is probably the index that most closely resembles the general macro economy as a whole. At any rate, large cap U.S. stocks have averaged 12.5% annual returns with a 20% standard deviation, which converts to a sharp ratio of 0.45. That means that about two-thirds of the years, the market should return 12%, plus or minus 20%, making a reasonable range for the stocks, something like an 8% loss on the low end, up to a 32% return on the high end. Let's contrast that with small cap stocks, where the average annual return since 1926 has been 16.5%, but where the standard deviation is a whopping 32%, converting into a sharp ratio of 0.406. At 16.5%, the returns are significantly better than large cap US stocks, but the 32% standard deviation really hurts their numbers. As such, a reasonable range for small cap stock returns would be 16.5%, plus or minus 32%. In other words, about two thirds of the time, or to be precise, 68% of the time, small cap stocks should return between a 15.5% loss and a 48.5% gain. So on a risk adjusted basis, the large cap stock portfolio is the best, historically speaking. Let's contrast that with something from the opposite end of the risk spectrum. Another important theme that is visible in the data is that while risk-free investments barely outpace inflation during an average year, they do generate slight increases in purchasing power over the long haul, indicating that investors, even riskless investors, are compensated for the delay of consumption. When we think of risk-free investments, we typically think of U.S. Treasury bills. As long as you hold them to maturity, and assuming the maturity is soon to happen, nothing can really happen to cause you not to receive the cash flows you're promised in the contract. Historically, short-term government bonds have yielded just a little bit higher than inflation at 3.5% and have a historic standard deviation of 3.1%. That means it would take a pretty bad year to cause treasury returns to go negative. In fact, two-thirds of the observations should fall within a range of 0.4% to 6.6%. Even in a pretty bad year, the treasury bill's return is still positive. However, even in a pretty good year, the yield on treasury bills isn't even close to the average return in the stock market. If you subtract from their yield the risk-free rate, you get zero. So you can't even compute a sharp ratio for Longer-term bonds historically have done better than inflation with long-term government bonds averaging 6% per year and with a standard deviation of 10%. That gives us a sharp ratio of 0.257. I want to reiterate that the distributions of the various returns on asset classes don't appear quite normal. There are more outliers than there should be, and the mean returns are more common than they should be. Therefore, our use of standard deviations to predict stock returns might not be as reliable as we would hope. Over the years, many investors have fallen victim to believing that they could predict market returns. Just enough of them have had a degree of success sufficient to make others wonder if they too could succeed in predicting stock prices. 
But whenever I doubt the efficiency of the capital markets, I just think about long-term capital management, the hedge fund founded by John Merriweather of Solomon Brothers, where Nobel Prize winners Myron Scholes and Bob Merton helped to apply historic models to future expected stock returns. However, in the late 1990s, the Asian and Russian financial crises led to the collapse of one of the most famous hedge funds in history. Don't get me wrong. These guys are smart. In fact, I used to work with Bob Merton at MIT, and he might be the smartest person I've ever met. But even a bunch of geniuses couldn't outsmart the market over the long term. So why do so many people invest in the capital markets? Because it is the most efficient way to earn a reasonable return that outpaces inflation while allowing for proper asset diversification. I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in the market, but understand that there are risks. If you invest sensibly, diversify properly, and manage risk when you need to, you can earn very healthy returns, allowing you to grow your wealth. But it will not be quick and easy, and taking a shortcut can end in disaster. Hopefully, I have whetted your appetite for what you will learn about financial risk later in the program.